Okay, everybody, we're going to have to do our own countdown since it didn't show up on the screen. So if you'll stand with me, we'll count down. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. It's time to worship God. Let's put our hands together.
don't deserve all that you have done for us. Oh God, we recognize that we don't deserve to be forgiven, but you are so kind to do that. Thank you for your sacrifice. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. Jesus, you are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you are my king. Jesus, you.
Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we do look at you as King Jesus. Lord Jesus, of all days today, we look at you as King Jesus. Lord, be king and ruler in our lives. Father God, I pray that your hand will be upon the rest of this service, that your spirit will fill us with your love and your compassion and your joy. Father God, I pray, Lord Jesus, your hand be upon us, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Greet your neighbor. Neighbor.
Good morning, River of Life. How y'all doing this morning? Good. We're going to go ahead and get some announcements going on. If I could please have the ushers come forward. Um, if you are new in the church house this morning, please raise your hand and the ushers will give you a visitor packet that you guys can fill out. And then later on, after church service, we will have some wonderful people over here to greet you guys if you are visitors. Now, for... Okay. So, good morning, guys. Our ushers are coming forward with visitor packets, so raise your hand if you're a visitor in the church house this morning. And then after um, church, we will have some wonderful people to greet you guys right over here at this blue table. Now for cardboard testimonies, for those of you who have signed up and are interested in participating in the cardboard testimonies, um, Pastor will be having a meeting right after service back there in the middle school classroom. So if you signed up for a cardboard testimony, please meet Pastor after service back in the middle school classroom. And Passion Week, that this is going to be an exciting thing going on this week. So Passion Week leading up to Easter, we will have a short devotional for each day that you can do alone or with family and friends. It will include the Bible verses that correlate to each day as well as discussion questions and there will be a handout the week of the week of with all the information as well as a short corresponding video message that will be available on the church Facebook page. Facebook videos will begin on Monday, so tomorrow, right? On Monday, and will end on Friday. So the material needed will be on the back table for you guys to grab after service. And Good Friday service. We will be having a Good Friday service here at the church on Friday, April 7th at 7 p.m. So please join us. It will be wonderful and it will be a lot of fun and a good way to celebrate the beginning of Easter. So um, the men's prayer breakfast, men come join us for a great time of fellowship and prayer. Also invite your friends and family and then come enjoy a great breakfast. Now for Easter Sunday, this year we will not have an Easter egg hunt, but I will be doing a lot of fun activities Easter activities for the kids on Easter for second service um, on Easter morning at 1030. The kids, you guys can drop the kids off over in the Life Center at 1030. So they will not be doing worship with us, but we will have our own worship and lots of Easter activities for the kids in the Life Center at 1030. And so come join us for Easter service. And we will, we are needing nursery volunteers. So if that is your calling or if um, God is putting it in your heart to volunteer for nursery, we are really needing some more volunteers back there in the nursery on Sundays. So if God is calling that on your heart, please talk to myself or the pastors. And now I will hand it off to Kobe. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it is the first Sunday of the month, so that means it's Mission Sunday, which I love. I'm excited about. I have a huge heart for missions, and um, I hope to kind of share my heart and my love for that with you guys and uh, see how the Lord uses us in this area. Um, but being Palm Sunday, I was reflecting on what happened, what all it means, and I was thinking about how the triumphal entry, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and you see him riding in on a donkey, and then the people throwing down palm branches and their, their robes for the donkey to walk on, and they're, they're recognizing Jesus as Messiah, as King, and I thought about how amazing this moment must have been for those that were there. 
And as I was reflecting on this, I was reflecting on what all this meant, Jesus coming in to Jerusalem for the last time, being crucified, bringing freedom and salvation to us, I began to think about the places across the globe where, in a sense, they're still waiting for that triumphal entry of Jesus into their countries, into their cities, into their communities, into their homes. And we as a church support many missionaries that are spreading the gospel across the globe, going to places just like that, that need the entry of Jesus into their communities, into their cities. People like Jonathan and Sarah Strong ministering in East Africa. People like Eugene Bach with Back to Jerusalem, who works in uh, the 1040 window. If you don't know what that is, that is uh, latitude, longitude, 1040. And this goes from Asia through North Africa, the Middle East. And it's this area of the world that is so unreached by the gospel that it's so difficult to bring the gospel into because of political situations, social situations where it's extremely dangerous, extremely difficult. People like Eugene Bach with Back to Jerusalem works tirelessly to bring the gospel into these areas, to bring Bibles into these areas, to supply the local churches with, the underground churches, which are growing rapidly in these areas of the world, which is just incredible and super encouraging to know that there's nothing that can stop the will of God. There's nothing that can stop the spreading of God's kingdom and the gospel. And as I began to think about these missionaries bringing the gospel message, bringing Bibles, the local people going out into their communities with the gospel message, with these Bibles, I just began to picture the triumphal entry happening again and again in cities, in communities, villages, and in homes and in people's lives. Christ coming and making a difference, changing hearts and lives, and people, just as we read the story uh, of the triumphal entry, people seeing Hosanna in the highest, recognizing Jesus as Messiah, as King, and as Savior. And so this is what missions is all about. And we, as a church, faithfully support missionaries all across the globe that are doing this work. And this ministry happening across the globe, the ministry happening here in Payette and the surrounding communities, it doesn't happen without your support and your faithful giving. And so I just want to encourage you guys to partner with us as we give to uh, places across the globe, ministering to people who are both literally impoverished and underprivileged, as well as the spiritually impoverished and underprivileged. And so if the ushers would like to come up, we're going to take offering. Uh, you can give your offering in the plate, in the box in the back, or so you can still give offering online. And um, yeah, we just encourage you guys to give. Um, and God is using this church in mighty ways. God is using our resources in mighty ways. And the Lord blesses us uh, when we are for his work. Uh, so let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity, God, uh, to give what you have already given us, Lord, back to you so that we can see your gospel spread throughout our communities, throughout our nation, and throughout the world, Lord. I pray that your work would not be hindered by anything, uh, but we would just see a great move of God come from these difficult times, God. I pray you bless uh, the offering, everything that is put in, and everybody who gives, Lord. In your name I pray, amen. These last few weeks, we have highlighted some of the fine arts kids with uh, Maddie and McKenna singing. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, see Elijah, Grace, and Abby's skit that they performed at Fine Arts, and they did an awesome job. They got superior with invitation, and they're just a lot of fun to watch, so I hope you enjoy it.
So if we pray, we can get a switch too? <gasps> yeah. I don't know. Should we try? Okay. What do we have to do? So first, you get on your knees. And then you put your hands together like this, and you close your eyes really tight like this. Okay. Dear God, can my friends have a switch just like me? Open your eyes. I don't see no switch. Well, did you close your eyes really tight? Mm-hmm. Were you peeking? No. Well, something's wrong. Did you say please? <gasps> my mom will give me anything if I don't say please. That's right. God will want us to be polite. Let's try it again. Dear God, can my friends please have a Nintendo Switch just like me? Open your eyes. Wait, aren't you supposed to say amen? <gasps> That's right. I forgot to say amen. How does God know when you're done if you don't say amen? Okay, here we go. Dear God, can my friends please have a Nintendo Switch just like me? Amen. And it didn't work again. Grace, what did you do wrong? Me? <gasps> maybe, maybe you guys have to pray. <gasps> yeah, that makes sense. Okay, I will pray. Dear God, can I please have a Nintendo Switch just like Grace? Amen. Me too, God. Maybe it's because we're too small, and you need to pray really loud. Really loud? Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do that. Dear God, can I please have an Nintendo Switch? Just like Grace. You forgot to say amen. Yes! Me too, God. God told me I, I should take your switch. <laughs> Give it back, or you're gonna meet Jesus right now. <laughs> what else could it be? When my grandma prays, she puts her hands in the air like this. <gasps> my grandma does the same thing. That's silly. I'm not doing that. Do you want? Switch or not? Okay, let's try it. Dear God, can I please have an Nintendo Switch just like it? Yeah! Ah! Me too, God. Maybe God ain't magic. Isn't that awesome? God isn't magic, is he? In fact, it goes along with what we're talking about today because God doesn't want to just be someone we call when we need something. He wants to be king and Lord of our lives. So this morning, I want to encourage you after service again in the junior high room, we are going to be uh, doing a cardboard testimony. And if you don't know what a cardboard testimony is, it's when God has done something really awesome in your life and you uh, write the thing that you have overcome on one side and then as you walk across the stage on Easter you're going to flip it, and it's going to say the thing that God has done for you. And so I just encourage you, if God's done something for you, it, it could be that he saved. I thought we already sent the kids. Nope. 
Kids go with Pastor Hope. All right. Harley got me all mixed up. I thought we sent the kids at the beginning. It's all good. Pastor Hope is back there for all the kids, so they got a great day playing for you over there. So uh, I encourage you. We're, uh, you know, as I do, a lot of we have a lot of guests on Easter, and they need to see what God's doing in our lives. And our testimony is so powerful because they can believe it for you. They can believe it for themselves. So I encourage you, uh, if you're not here and you're online or, or uh, something, you can still be part of this. But how many of you know that we need to give God glory for what he's done in our lives? All right. So also on the end of your seats, you'll find a little stack. There's five in here. Don't get scared. I need somebody from each row to find f some one person. Find five people that don't usually attend and give these out this week. And so if you're up for the challenge, take these with you. If not, then you can ask the person next to you. But hopefully we can go out and invite people. Uh, uh, as I, we were planning, we have a 9 o'clock service uh, next Sunday. If you don't want to be around the crowd or you want to come early and because you have great other things planned throughout the day, please come uh, to the 9 o'clock service. And we also have a regular 1030 service. We're, uh, we're just not doing the choir in the first service. That's the only thing that's different. And so uh, we just encourage you to invite somebody, bring somebody with you, drag them if you have to. Uh, but uh, go talk to that neighbor that you don't talk to. Go, go, here's your excuse to walk across your lawn and talk to the neighbor uh, that you don't usually get to talk to. Or uh, carry them in your car if you see somebody. Uh, hand them out as, as you're going throughout your day. It doesn't just have to be. Uh, and then also, if you're interested, we, uh, as long as weather permits, thurs Thursday at 4.30, we are going to meet here at the church again. And we're going to continue to hit the neighborhood over off 6th Street. We're going to continue to invite people to church. We've, we've come across some really nice people. Uh, we've been able to pray for a couple of people. Uh, and just uh, express the love of God. And so we just encourage you, if you're able to come, please come. And, uh, and then you can even come to Gus's uh, small group afterwards. And, and so you can make a whole day out of just being around people and expressing God's love to them. So I just want to encourage you uh, to do that. So if you would open to Matthew 21, we're going to jump in. A lot of you know today is Palm Sunday. Uh, we're going to go over a little bit more, but Kobe is right. Jesus entered the city, and he was making his triumphant entry. And this morning, we want to talk about how that triumphant entry into people's lives can change them forever. And we do support our missionaries, and we, we, uh, it's awesome when we get to see them on Facebook, and sometimes they even get to come around, and, and we get to talk to them and see what God's doing around the world. But it all started on his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. If you would stand with me this morning. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 5, it says, As Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpad on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them ahead. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks what you are doing, just say, the Lord needs them. Say that with me this morning. The Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, Tell the people of Jerusalem, Look, your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. Lord, we thank you for this morning. I thank you for everyone who's here and those online. I pray that your hand would be upon us. I pray that we would just get as much out of this message as that you have for us. I pray that it will pierce hearts just as it has pierced mine preparing it this week. Lord, we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. 
Amen. You may be seated. There's a lot leading up to this day, and this is actually the first time that we see Jesus refer to himself as Lord openly. We see him talk to his disciples. We've seen him talk to even John's disciples. We see him talk to the woman at the well. We see him in many different instances on a one-on-one basis refer to himself as Lord or Savior, but this is the first time publicly he's going and telling the disciples to refer to him as Lord. Before this, in three times, Jesus has predicted that this day would come and that actually his death was coming soon. In Matthew 16, 21, in Matthew 17, 22, and in Matthew 20, 17, Jesus predicts that his death is going to be coming And he's preparing his disciples. And what I don't know about you, but when I'm preparing for someone, something for someone that that is really, really important, I don't usually go and dump the whole thing on them all at once. And if we look at the steps that Jesus was taking with his disciples, each time that Jesus talked about his death, he got a little bit more specific on what was going to happen. The first time Jesus was just informing them about what was going to happen, he didn't give them very many details of what was going to happen. The second time, Jesus uh, would tell them that he would be handed over to his enemies and be killed. And then came the third time. And this time it was very, very descriptive of what the disciples were going to see Jesus go through. And the third time it says, in that the religious leader sentenced Jesus to die. Then the hand of Jesus, the hand over Jesus to the Romans, where Jesus would be mocked, flogged, and whipped, and crucified. In the same way, each time, he assured them. On each time, he told them, he said, this is coming, but I assure you on the third day, I will rise again. So Jesus was preparing them for this day. And even Palm Sunday is preparing us for what Jesus is going to do, because as Jesus was entering the city, as it is written in all four Gospels, Palm Sunday is in all four Gospels. And so when we see something that is in all four Gospels, it's just like in the Bible, sometimes you'll see where it says, holy, holy, holy. It's not saying holy three times. It's saying holy with an exclamation point that this is important. I want you to pay attention. This, the four Gospels were written to different audiences. So this was something that, the, that God wanted the world to know that the Palm Sunday was so important that it was written in all four Gospels. It's in Matthew 21, Luke 19, and John 12. These verses have a little bit of di- uh, difference, but most of it is the triumphant entry of Jesus. And when he's coming into the city, we see that Jesus is coming in to being the Lord that we all know him today. And the point one is, is Jesus and the disciples were headed to Jerusalem. This is a big deal. Because during this time, Jesus was ministering people. He, he was healing the sick. He was, he was seeing many miracles happen. It is a time when he even spent the, uh, the, a meal at Zacchaeus' house. We're seeing that this is a, a time that Jesus was almost in like full 24-7 ministry. He was, he was ramping up for Palm Sunday. He would go and teach with his in parables to the people. He really wanted people to understand who he was and what he was about to do. We also see that this is the time when he raises Lazarus from the dead. And this is the time that this is one of the most important miracles that we see Jesus do because Jesus is coming in to himself and what God has called him to do. We've seen Jesus raise people from the dead before, but nobody that was raised from the dead was in the tomb for four days. So this was something that was getting noticed. This was getting popularity. And, and so they, it was a big deal. We, we look back at, on it today, and, and we obviously see that raising somebody from the dead is a, 
is a big deal. I think if, if, we had, see, if we see that happen, when we pray for someone and they're raised from the dead, I think that would probably hit the top ten list of days of our lives. When we see God move in something that is dead and it is alive again, it is something that we're going to remember. It's something that we're going to talk about. It's something that's going to get out and the word is going to spread. This miracle was a big deal. And it was something that really upset the Pharisees. This really, really upset the Pharisees. You know how much that it upset the Pharisees? They couldn't even be happy with Lazarus because they were plotting to kill him again. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to have kill me again after my name. I mean, if Jesus raises me from the dead, then that's awesome. But they wanted to go out and kill Lazarus because the word The word was getting out of how powerful Jesus was and who Jesus was, and they were not accepting him for who Jesus was. Jesus was basically going around doing the things that God called him to do, and he was trying to get people, you know what, do you get it? I'm the Messiah. But he wasn't wearing a sign or he wasn't wearing his favorite sports team. I'm the Messiah shirt or anything like that. He was going around doing what God had called him to do. And God calls us to do that as well. To go around and do what God has called us to do. Whatever calling God has put on your life. He encourages you to go and do that. Not for your recognition but for the recognition given to the Lord. And that's what Jesus was doing. And the Pharisees were very, very upset about it. Some even wondered if Jesus would even show his face at Passover because the priests and and, and the Pharisees were out to get him. And they said, if anybody's seen them, let them know and they would arrest him immediately. And we see that uh, that this time is, is when Jesus was in Bethany and he was... He was anointed with oil as a story that we all see. The lady came in and anointed Jesus' feet with oil. The disciples got mad because they were wasting oil. And Jesus said, you know what? You, you, You won't have me forever. She's anointing me and preparing me for my death and burial. And so we're seeing that things are getting heated up. And as if we go through the gospel, we can kind of see that Jesus' ministry is at full-fledged. He's full steam ahead. And it's about for him to now become the person or announce that he is the person that a lot of people thought he might be. But this was him saying it to everyone. And Matthew 21, 6 through 11, it says, The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt with him and threw their garments over the colt and sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession and the people all around him were shouting, Praise God, praise God for the son of David. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in the highest heavens. The entry city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. Who is this, they asked. The crowds replied, it is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And we see this right here. Matthew is the only one that mentions not just the cult, but the mom of the cult. And we don't know. uh, Most people have come to the conclusion that this donkey, uh, this cult was never ridden. It was a brand new colt that was just born recently. It was strong enough to carry Jesus, but it had never been written by any anyone. We see that that uh, it might of the reason why Matthew might have included it, because if the colt had never been ridden, it would have probably be nice for the colt to have its mommy around when we're little and, and we're still learning things. How many of you guys want your mommy around sometimes? Right. And so the colt might have been kept calm by, by uh, the mommy being around in, in, in the other Gospels. Uh, it doesn't mention the older colt, so it's not a for sure. But, we, but Matthew mentions that both the mother and the colt were present. And see, Jesus rides on the donkey. See, Jesus rides on the donkey that Jesus would usually walk from time to time, but everywhere he goes. This is the only mention in the Bible that we see that Jesus did not walk from one place to the other. Now, he might have ridden in a, a cart or he might have done something, but it's never specifically mentioned that Jesus did anything more than walk 
from place to place. And I don't know about you, but if I walked most of the time and then I got a ride from someone, I think I would mention the ride that I got, that I didn't have to walk from one place to the other. And some of these places, even uh, Beth Podge to Jerusalem was about seven to eight miles long. It's not just a walk across the street. Some have predicted that Jesus walked over 3,000 miles in his lifetime. So how many of you know each night he had to charge his Fitbit, right? He had to make sure he was getting his steps in. And Jesus was traveling from place to place. And we see that this is the only time that Jesus is mentioned riding on an animal or riding in something or, or not walking from place to place. So we have to know that this is an important occasion. We have to know that this is something that's going to stand out. That this is not just a, a, a walk into Jerusalem because Jesus had been to Jerusalem before. He had walked in with his disciples. So why this time on Palm Sunday when we know that Easter's coming next week, but why this time did he ride on a donkey? And so if you didn't know, in, in New Mexico, we actually had a donkey. And um, they're stubborn. And so uh, she was the best little donkey that we, that I, I was the only donkey I've ever had. But she was really cool. We would go and work in her pen and she would come and she'd put her head on, her, on, on my shoulder as I was working. And sometimes I had to shoe because she's got a heavy head. And so uh, she was really, really good with the girls as long as they were on her back and not walking around. But sometimes she would get excited. And it was really fun. I don't know if I'd ever have a donkey again, but I, I had a donkey, and, and, and they're really cool animals. Some of them are, are, are the best known. They're like walk, watchdogs, and anybody come around our property, she would neigh, and she would let us know. She'd also let us know when she was hungry. She would clean up around, the, uh, around the, her pen. There was nothing, no, no weeds or anything else in her pen. And we know this because as we were moving, when we began to get rid of the animals, then the weeds would come up. And we're like, where have the weeds been? And they had just been hiding underneath the dirt until the animals left. But it was fun having a donkey. Donkeys are very loyal animals, very, uh, uh, are very nice to be around. And, and, and we, we had fun with our donkey. But Matthew mentions in 21.55 the reason that Jesus rode on a donkey. And it's a quote from Zechariah 9.9. 9. And it says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. And so we see this is something that has been in Scripture for a long time. And we see that Jesus is riding on a donkey because the king is coming. The king is coming. And, and what we see is as he was leaving uh, Beth Page and going toward Jerusalem, we see that he's coming out in a triumphant way. And he goes up to the Mount of Olives. And it says in Scripture that he'll come down on a donkey from Mount of Olives. So when it says that he's in the middle of the procession, there's a procession coming with him. There's a procession coming from Jerusalem. And they're beginning to see Jesus as king. And this morning, as, as we look at other places in the Bible, when, so, when uh, Solomon was crowned king, David told the priest and the prophet Nathan to go and put him on his donkey and take him and anoint him to be king, and he was king. The fact that Jesus was on a donkey was him saying, I'm the Messiah, I'm the king. It was him saying it, not somebody wondering it or somebody thinking that he might be. Or we even see that Peter at one time says that you are the Messiah, but this is publicly saying that I'm the king. And the people respond just as the only way they know how. In, in John 12, 12 and 13, it says the next day, the news that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem swept, swept, uh, swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took the palm branches and went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings to the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail 
to the king of Israel. They came and they placed their robes uh, on the donkey. The uh, disciples placed the robe on the donkey as a form of respect, as a form of God's kingship. And the people were laying down their robes on the street as well as palm trees to show that they were part of his kingdom. And the palm trees uh, represented victory. When when this was a national sign, there's even some uh, of the other Gospels. Only John actually mentions specifically palm trees. But we see if you look at the history, there's actually uh, tree branches woven together on coins that the Israelites had as their national coin. And the branches that were mentioned were national things like when we salute our flag and when we, when we have a national anthem or, or those things, these branches represented how they were part of a kingdom, uh, the Israelite kingdom. This was their, their showing homage to Jesus as their king. Later in Revelations, we'll see that there will be a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. And they will be clothed in white robes and they held palm branches in their hands. See, Jesus was coming in on a donkey in this moment, but there will be a day when he will come in on a white horse and it'll be a day of war, not a day of peace. It'll be a day that he will be above everyone else instead of lowly sitting on a donkey. When a king enters the city in a time of war, he's usually on a stallion or a colt. And what they do is they actually use their hands to measure how high the horses are. And nobody is going to be higher than the king's horse. So any of his commanders or any of the other people in the procession, they can't have a horse that is higher than the, the king's horse during the time of war maybe that's where they get the saying get off of your high horse and the thing is we need to get off of our high horse and let jesus have the high horse we need to recognize him as king in our life see these palm branches were also used in in an earlier uh, revelation by the Maccabees when they thought that the Maccabees were going to come in and, and, and give them a kingdom inside of this. They were going to overthrow the Roman government. So palm trees was a symbol of victory. And Jesus was claiming his victory. We even see if, uh, I remember when they had like the memorial, not memorial, but like an anniversary of the Olympics and the first time that they had been in Greece, and, and even in Greek mythology, the palm branches mean victory, and they, and they would give the, uh, the uh, Olympians the medals, and then they would give them kind of like a leafy crown that they would put on their head. And I always wondered what that was, but it was a sign of victory, and they would give it to the, to the uh, Olympian who won the gold medal. And so these palm branches are a symbol of victory. These the cloaks mentioned again, and in, in, uh, if you look at 2 Kings 3, or 9, 13, it says, They quickly spread out the cloaks on the, uh, on the bare steps and blew the ram's horn, shouting, Jehu is king. In a sense, these cloaks represented a throne that Jesus was sitting on. A throne that each one of us should throw our cloaks down so that Jesus can sit on the throne of our hearts. That this morning that we need to see that the only way that we can have victory is if we make Jesus king. John 12, 16 tells us that even the disciples didn't fully understand what was going on, but they realized it after Jesus' glory. When Jesus was brought into glory, they, they realized what they were actually looking at. And sometimes as, as Jesus begins to work on our hearts, sometimes we don't have the full revelation of what we're, Jesus is asking us. But as time progresses, we see that Jesus c calmly comes and sits on the, king of our, uh, on the throne of our heart. And he gives us victory over sin and death. That someday we will walk with him in paradise. That we will be with Jesus. See, making Jesus king of our life is more than just fire insurance. The, more than just saying, I don't want to go to hell. It's allowing Jesus 
to come into our lives and change us into the person that he wants us to be. And many people have written many books. And I, and I, I came to the conclusion this week that sometimes we get in the mainstream of things and we get the wrong message. Many times we'll read books and we're trying to find God's plan for our life. God, what is God, what's your plan for my life? This morning I want to burst your bubble. God doesn't necessarily have a plan for your life. He has your life in his plan. Jesus has a plan already. We don't need individual plans. The plan is that Jesus sits on our heart. The plan is like last week when we talked about being a witness to Jesus for what Jesus has done. The plan will be that people will walk across the stage with their cardboard testimonies so that people realize that Jesus is king, that Jesus changed your life, and he can change the other life that's sitting next to you. It's part, it's time that we stop knowing knowing that it's all about me and know that it's all about him because we need to be part of his plan, not try to manipulate the Bible and everything else to fit into our plan. God has a plan, and that's that we will all be with him someday in paradise. God wants to bless everything you put your hands to. God wants it to be a representation of his blessing. God wants to pour out his blessings as long as we Have the right heart and know that he is the king that sits on the throne. Jesus came into the city claiming his kingship, claiming his lordship. And Jesus wants to be king and lord of our lives too. Sunday morning is just a rally cry. We need to have Jesus on our hearts Monday through Friday. I encourage you this week to join us for the Passion Week. Kobe and Hope have put so much effort into this. And as we film the videos and we, we, we encourage you to take the full revelation of what Jesus did for you. That Je- it's not just, he died for me, yay, let me live my life. It's not, he died for me, yay, I got fire insurance, let me live my life. No, Jesus wants to be in every aspect of your life, intertwined in your family, in your career. He wants you to be the best dad that represents Jesus. He wants you to be the best employee that represents Jesus. He wants you to be the most uh, 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 company owner that represents Jesus. You want to look at the best companies out there, the ones that put God first. We might not see it. And we might not know exactly what's going on in these companies, but those who have a reputation of putting God first, they're the most charitable, they're the most loving, and they're most, and it starts from the top. And it could start with me and you. That God wants us to know that He is the King of our lives and that we have a place in His kingdom. We see that the Pharisees are getting mad, they're getting upset. They're getting uh, in an uproar because Jesus isn't following their plan. In fact, they were so mad because he raised Jesus from the dead, not because they stopped going to the temple and they started going to follow Jesus. So this morning, I want you to know we're here to follow Jesus. We're in this church to follow Jesus. This is not about four songs and, and, a, and a nice message, and then we all go home and pat each other on the back. This is a, a rally cry that we can go and get pay at for Jesus. We need to see people saved. We need to see people healed. We need to see people delivered. We need to see the move of God throughout our town because this world can offer them nothing. Jesus can offer them everything. In Philippians 2, verses 1 through 11, it says that we have to have the attitude of Christ. It says there... Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Ride on a donkey. Think of others as better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. We need to be riding our donkeys. 
We need to come in humbly as, as what God has called us to do, as God has filled our lives. We need to humbly come because when we lose sight of Jesus, we lose sight of what he wants to do in our lives. When we lose sight of him, we think it's all about us. Or if we take pride in anything that God has given us, we've placed it in the wrong spot. We need to rejoice and know that it all comes from him. That we need to ride our donkeys for Jesus. And as I close this morning and the worship team comes, if we continue along in Philippians in verse number 6, it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, go, elevate him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names. That the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth. Every tongue shall declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. See, just as we are here to be part of the plan that Jesus has for the world, Jesus plan was to bring glory to the Father. In everything he did, he brought glory to the Father. In everything we do this morning, let's bring glory to the Father. When they walked through the crowd, they yelled out, Hosanna. Those words mean save us now. The Jews were looking for someone to save them from the Romans. And they let their king walk right by. In the book of John, it says that Jesus went up and he began to look over the city and he began to weep. Because even though he had went through the city on the donkey and the palm branches, their heart was not in the right spot. And Jesus quotes word for word the destruction of Jerusalem. Exactly how it would happen 30 years later. Because they didn't see him as the king of kings. This morning, as you stand with us and we worship together. If you're here for the first time or you need to recommit your life to the Lord. Or you need to commit your life to him to the first time. Make him king of your heart. Let him sit on the throne of your heart. If you just raise your hand, I'd like to pray with you. If you'd like to ask Jesus as your Savior. Amen. This morning, if we've gotten our eyes off Jesus, if he's not sitting on the throne of our hearts, if we've asked the question many times of what's the plan that God has for my life and we want to change that question to God, what do you have so that I can be part of your plan? It's not about us, it's about him. It's about finding our place in his plan. And his plan is to take as many with us to heaven as possible. So this morning as the altar team comes and we get ready to pray, the altars will be open as we worship together for any need you might have. But if you're looking for your place in God's plan, I encourage you to come up and let us pray with you. So that God can open your eyes. Because you know what? The church needs you. The church needs evangelists. 
to go out and invite people in. The people, the church needs other pastors that can minister to people when they get here. The church needs teachers that can help us go deeper in God's word. I was listening to a message and it really did resonate with me is this, sometimes churches have evangelists for pastors. And usually the church is very wide, but it's not very deep. Jesus wants us to go deep. My desire for you as a pastor is that you go deep into your relationship with the Lord. That you go deep into his word. That you believe that Jesus can heal today. That you believe that Jesus can answer your prayer. That it's not something that hits the ceiling and goes and falls back down. That we truly believe the Bible and know the Bible. And when we're praying, we even quote the Bible. Some of my best prayer times is when I'm just going through the different things that Jesus has done for others, knowing that he's able to do them for me. But I want to see us deep in the Word of God. I want to see revelations in people's lives. I want to see people set free. I want to see things happen in people's life and not just us do drive through church, but see us go deeper. See us give those things that we've been holding on to to Jesus. As your pastor, I want to see us all go deeper. Now that's not a knock. That's an encouragement. It's not looking down on you. It's looking up, trying to push you down, down into the Word of God. Maybe my words don't make sense, but you know what I'm saying. I want to encourage you. We talked about the Holy Spirit being an encourage you. The Holy Spirit encourages us to go deeper with God. We see all the people who line the streets. They say that in, during this time of Passover, there could have possibly been a little less than 3 million people there. But we see 120 in the upper room. I'd rather have 120 in the upper room than have 3,000 lined around the block that don't get who Jesus is. I'm so grateful that you're here this morning. I'm so grateful that you came to church. I'm so thankful that you're here. I might not get to shake everybody's hand or see everybody's smiling face, but I am thankful that you're here. I am thankful that you're seeking to go deeper with the Lord. And I challenge you, go deeper with God. He'll meet you every time. Let's not just go on the surface. Let's go deeper with him. So this morning, if you want to go deeper with him and you need prayer for any other item or any other ish, ish stuff in your life, please come to the altars as we worship together.
I just pray this morning that that will be the song that's on our heart. That he is so loving and so generous. And he's such an awesome God. And that he loves us so much. And wants to be king in our lives. In Jesus' name, let your blessings flow over your people this morning, Jesus. Lord, I pray that they'll take this home with them, that it will shape their week. Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit will fill them, Father God. Let their cup runneth over. Let the cup runneth over, Lord Jesus. Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Have an awesome week. We'll see you next week. Remember to bring a friend. And follow us this week on Facebook.